Uh, I feel slightly fraudulent in a way with my title because when Norman asked me to do this presentation, he said, I know that the audience will be very interested in mindfulness, so if you could touch on that, uh, we'd be very grateful. I am going to touch on mindfulness, uh, but I'm not an expert in mindfulness, but I'm going to relate it to um, a trend that I have been researching now quite intensively since 2004. Uh, when I began to write a book with my co-author, Dennis Hayes, it took o almost five years to write that book, sort of the gestation of it and then the, the actual production of it, which was called The Dangerous Rise of Therapeutic Education, which has turned out to be um, a source of great controversy. I mean, we knew when we wrote it that we were being controversial, but we didn't have any real idea of quite how much in the face of progressive, and I'm going to put scare marks around that uh, word now, as I always do anyway, um, quite how much in the face of progressive ideas about education, we, it, we were flying against those ideas. So I'm going to talk about mindfulness in the context of what has been, over that 15 years, um, the continuing rise of therapeutic education. And I will, uh, during the course of my presentation, try and define what I mean by therapeutic education because it's far more than simply applying the techniques of therapy to educational settings. And my question, sort of following that book, really, is are the things we're seeing in schools, colleges and universities progressive? I should have put scare marks on the actual screen or dangerous, and I'm going to argue that, although many people argue that they're progressive, they have real dangers for education, but not just for education, as I shall try to show. So one of the things I'm going to do is to, in a way, start with um, my own career, really, which was, as I now realise, in 1979, when I left university, and trained as a Rogerian group counsellor and started working with unemployed teenagers on Margaret Thatcher's youth unemployment, sorry, that was a Freudian slip, youth <laughs> opportunities programmes, which were a response to the first wave of mass youth unemployment that started in the 1970s. And we were doing life and social skills on those programmes. And I now realise that I was in the vanguard of therapeutic education. We were doing circle time with unemployed 16-year-olds long before primary schools shifted it from a show-and-tell to a much more therapeutic process that it now often is. But one of the things that's interesting when you start to think about a research interest or a research question is that over the years since I started to work with those un unemployed young people and then went on to work with women with no qualifications who were doing access to higher education courses, is a massive shift in 10 years, really, in how we regard those types of student. And the shift is towards what Kate Brown, a uh, lecturer in social policy at the University of York, calls the vulnerability zeitgeist. And I'm going to say something, just how powerful and how rapid um, the vulnerability zeitgeist has become and how influential it is in the way that we now regard the purposes of education. Um, and I'm going to link that uh, because, again, this is a massive shift in the 15 years that I've been looking at all this, is an almost unchallenged, virtually unchallenged consensus that we are facing apocryphal declining levels of mental health amongst children and young people. And this is a massive shift in how we see children and how we see young people, and a real sense that childhood is in crisis. And that's the sort of shift that I've been looking at. And I'm going to link that to the rise of interventions that can come under the umbrella of therapeutic education and say a little bit uh, of what those are, in which mindfulness now fits as a type of intervention. And I'm going to ask whether it's progressive or dangerous. And one of the things that, um, as a sociologist, that has really influenced me in thinking about this is uh, the, 
the, the American sociologist C. Wright Mills, who wrote The Sociological Imagination in 1959, which was a, a groundbreaking book. And C. Wright Mills is interested, uh, as I am, in combining history, psychology, and sociology. And I think one of the things I've learned is that we're missing philosophy from this sort of combination of subjects that try to help us understand how what he called private troubles become public issues. And that's the really interesting thing when we relate it to a sort of therapeutic ethos. But also, he was interested in the human subject. He asked, what varieties of men and women come to prevail in a particular historical period at a particular, uh, in a particular society? And how does that affect institutional processes culture, everyday life. Now, I can't answer all of those huge sociological questions, but I'm framing my exploration of therapeutic education around the question, what human subject is therapeutic education responding to, and what do we think of that subject? And I'm going to give some examples of how universities are now very much caught up in therapeutic education in a way that hadn't happened uh, when I first started writing about this. So if I just take that period of time, 79 to 2015, the language of vulnerability has gone off the scale, I would say. And I'm going to show in a minute how the, the Labour government, um, the last Labour government, expanded the official criteria to define the vulnerable in terms of policy, but how much that has crept into everyday uh, language, everyday references to ourselves, to our colleagues, to our students, to our children, I would argue. And so the language that was absolutely non-existent when I was working with my young people in the late 70s, early 80s, and very disadvantaged women students who were doing access courses, none of this language appeared. We never talked about fragile identities. We didn't talk about anxiety and stress and all of those things. And I've just listed um, a few phrases, both from policy documents, but also from academic research, and words, sorry, phrases like low self-esteemers, which teachers now routinely use, the low self-esteemers in my class. So this language has really, I think, uh, sort of taken off. And if we look at the official criteria for vulnerability, this is quite important because they have shifted massively from 1995 to the idea that the vulnerable who needed protection were, in the Latin meaning of the word, at risk of being wounded, were at risk of serious harm or exposure to, uh, or to um, real threats. The Care Standards Act, the Safeguarding Vulnerable Groups Act, have now expanded the official definition of vulnerability to the point where if you're prescribed counselling or palliative care, you are officially defined as vulnerable. So that's been a, an exponential uh, sort of shift, really. Ofsted, in its recent report on uh, building inclusive schools, uh, endorses these sorts of um, expanded meanings by defining disadvantaged children, immigrants, those with disabilities or special educational needs, children not meeting their assessment targets or needing additional support as vulnerable. And in some schools now, that sort of notion of vulnerability and the way that um, it draws down funding uh, is, is used very sort of instrumentally by schools to try and get additional funding at time when budgets are being cut. But as I said, we also have everyday references to vulnerability that, I mean, maybe I just sort of look out for all this and I notice it too much because I'm thinking about it and writing about it. But a colleague said to me the other day, we need to be, in a sort of very sort of sotto voice, we need to be very careful of um, so-and-so because she's very vulnerable at the moment. And what that meant was is just don't give her a hard time or, or whatever. But we have everyday references that children are vulnerable to self-harm, anxiety, stress, body image issues, pornography, etc., etc. So the language of vulnerability has really expanded. But more recently, we have the idea that you're vulnerable 
if you're just too open. If you're too open with people, you're vulnerable to, well, I'm not quite sure what. But what that does is it begins to insert a notion of the sort of mistrust of other people, that they can make you vulnerable for really very mundane things. You could be making me vulnerable because you're looking bored or because you're on your iPhone and you're not engaging with my talk or whatever. But the language, and that's not, it's, a, it's a sort of joke, but the language of vulnerability, I think, isn't just a trivial thing. It starts to fundamentally shape the way that we see each other. And certainly students in my own university that I supervise and teach are beginning to use that language in all sorts of ways. And one of the things that um, <clears throat> I've been doing some work recently with our university counselling services uh, is that universities are now presented with students presenting as vulnerable in ways that they weren't experiencing two years ago. So th there's a whole, there's something going on, and maybe it is, as Kate Brown says, a zeitgeist. One of the things that is interesting about these two particular slides for me is that I produced them, um, I think now nearly three years ago. And one of the things that uh, I notice is I look at the headlines. These were just taken from various newspapers, uh, which, which was this beginning of this idea that we're facing uh, a crisis of mental ill health um, amongst young people, and that the answer, this microphone is extreme, is it me or is it extremely erratic? <laughs> Can you hear me okay at the back? It's yes, I, I ought to just keep still, shouldn't I, like you did. I should just go, I'll just go and stand here. Sorry, I do move around. I'll try and keep still. Um, but the, the idea was, is still, I think, and if we look at headlines now, they haven't gone away at all. In fact, if I updated this, this, these two slides, we would see that there are even more references to these sorts of things. But the idea is that schools are the main site, not families, not other settings, but schools colleges and universities are, are the main site for trying to address problems of mental ill health, emotional well-being, etc. And early intervention, which the Conservative government has really picked up on following the Labour government, the idea that early intervention in families is key to preventing problems in the future. So we've got a number of policy themes that go around this, We've got early prevention. We've got the idea that we have a crisis, um, and it is worse than it was in the 1930s. We have all sorts of headlines like depression has trebled since the 1960s, etc. cetera. Um, but the point is that schools are the place to sort it out. And as I was preparing for this last week, this was on the front of the Saturday Times. The head of Cheltenham Ladies College is going to stop homework as a contribution to combating uh, her young women's rising levels of anxiety and depression. And she says that we are being completely irresponsible if schools don't respond to these rising levels of depression. Now, <clears throat> we could get into that as an example of a, of a response. The interesting thing there, I think, is that whereas before, maybe for three or four years ago, the target group tended to be people from disadvantaged social groups. One of the things that we now see in this sort of zeitgeist is that all classes of people are encompassed by it. So Cheltenham Ladies College, of course, is one of the most privileged schools in the country. But the idea that young, high-achieving women are particularly vulnerable to mental ill health has been a, sort of a slightly more additional um, contribution to the debate. And I think that the, the problem there, when you read that article and you read what the head of the college says, and we can see it in all the headlines and, and even in the research reports that are promoting this idea as well, is that anxiety, stress, low self-esteem, mental ill health, emotional well-being, depression, are all being elided in really, really confusing, vague, and ever-expanding ways. And that makes it really difficult to intervene in the debate, because if you start to question it, you sound like, a bit like you were saying about questioning the progressive consensus, that you're saying people aren't suffering from 
these things, but people are redefining these things as well. It links, of course, to a very sort of common theme that we've seen. Again, this was written in 2006, the idea that childhood itself has become toxic and that all those things on the left uh, in Susie Palmer's book, some of which actually contradict each other, but all of these things are making childhood worse. And again, this is the apocryphal claim that goes round worse than at any time in history, which I always just think is, you know, there's an idea that it's never been worse for children. So one of the outcomes of this is if we start to look at the, the policy responses under the previous Labour government, uh, which started to respond in the late 1990s to these sorts of concerns, really took off um, in the early 2000s with Every Child Matters and the Social and Emotional Learning Strategy for Schools, um, is the idea very much fueled by different branches of psychology, counselling, self-help, all sorts of different strands that are in this. The idea that well-being and, one has to sort of put a slash really, well-being, mental health, elided very problematically, those two terms, are really a set of teachable psychological, I always call them things, because they sometimes people call them skills, sometimes people call them capabilities, people call them dispositions or attitudes. But the idea is that all that list on the PowerPoint there is teachable, transferable from one situation to another. If you teach it early, you can then apply it in all sorts of life situations. And that's been, that idea is still very much prevalent, even though the coalition government abandoned the social and emotional aspects of learning strategy and has replaced it with character, resilience and grit. And so character has been resurrected as a, a much older idea um, by the conservative government. Um, but if you look closely at all the research that's being done around character, it is the same set of skills or things. They're psychological things. Um, the government has added the three things on the right, hope, aspiration and community mindedness to the Labour government's previous list. But apart from that, the list is the same. It does keep growing. Some people add things like learning to learn and employability and all sorts of other things to it. So there have been, a, <clears throat> over the period I'm talking about, um, a number of institutional responses that schools have made to these ideas and the idea that we can teach emotional well-being or character or whatever it is. There are a number of different responses. One has been to put in place more formal specialist support for the growing numbers of children that are diagnosed with various behavioural and emotional disorders. And those have gone off the scale as well. So the number of children being officially diagnosed uh, has risen hugely and continues to rise. We get other ideas, though, which is where teachers, and this comes back to me in the vanguard of all this as a young Marxist, as I happened to be at the time, uh, life and social skills lecturer. I thought I was so progressive. Uh, I, I thought I was so progressive compared to all the old didactic dinosaurs that these uh, poor young people had been inflicted with. I've now completely changed my mind. I've recanted, as they say. Um, but the idea that teachers or learning support assistants or inclusion mentors, and if you look on the websites of schools nowadays, this is just carrying on and on. There are many, many paraprofessionals who come in and give sort of therapeutic forms of support, but they're not experts. They're like me. They're trained in a little bit of counselling, a little bit of peer mentoring, and then they become supporters uh, to children who are finding it difficult to deal emotionally with school. So we've had a lot of... Uh, um, universal interventions, which are different from specialist interventions. The idea would be in a universal intervention that we would all do the intervention and those amongst us who had issues or problems would be inclusive, included in that in a very non-stigmatising way. But the idea is that if we do a universal intervention, everybody benefits uh, in the way that I've just described. So in universities, 
we now have workshops for dealing with procrastination, exam anxiety. Uh, you can even go to a university workshop at Sheffield to deal with your problems of perfectionism because it causes you such anxiety to be a perfectionist. Um, we've seen a massive growth, which I'll come back to, of mindfulness. Mindfulness has replaced or is beginning to replace positive psychology, if anything could be possible. It's no longer enough to be positive thinking or positively minded. You have to be mindful. I'm going to come back to that. But it's really, really fashionable. Everybody loves mindfulness. It's the, the intervention du jour. So um, I'm, I'm going to set up as a mindfulness consultant. I think it's my, my next career. I'll make a killing. Um, but we've also got cognitive behavior therapy, which is very much advocated by Sir Richard Layard, uh, the happiness czar of the last government, all of these other things. I've got a friend's child who is doing mental toughness training before his GCSEs, where there is a form of resilience training adapted from the US Army, which does resilience training for its soldiers. Um, the student welfare officer at Sheffield uh, wants all lecturers to have what he calls mental health first aid training. Um, and then you've got a much more diffused thing, which I think is growing, actually, and it's the thing that was referred to in the, um, the newspaper column, which is a much more diffused sense of needing a lot of emotional support. So, again, different types of intervention uh, going on in schools. That's an example of two learning outcomes from the social emotional aspects of learning strategy. There were 40 outcomes for primary school children and 27 for secondary school children. And I look at both of those and think, well, at 59 and three quarters, I still haven't really mastered either of those two things. But I'm, and the word of competence-based assessment I'm moving towards. So if we just look at mindfulness for one minute, because Norman asked me to touch on mindfulness, so I will. Um, one of the things that's interesting about mindfulness compared to all the other type of psycho-emotional interventions I've already mentioned is that, of course, it has very strong ethical Buddhist foundations. Uh, so it's unlike some of those other interventions in that way. But what's happened, of course, is that my, my brother-in-law, who's a, a Buddhist, uh, and he's not the only one to be quite alarmed at this, is that the, the sort of secular techniques that we're now seeing on software apps or in um, lots of workplaces, my own university is talking about introducing mindfulness sessions as part of its well-being program for academic staff, not just academic staff, all staff, um, is that it's become a secular sort of skill, if you like, um, one of the things that's interesting when you start to look into the field of mindfulness and how it's being applied is that big global corporations like Google and Apple and British Airways are making it almost a compulsory thing for their employees to do. So if you're a Google employee, not only are you supposed to get up and walk around uh, to, you know, to stop the problems of sitting, you are supposed to take part in company mindfulness lessons, sessions, um, as part of being a productive worker. So one of the things that's happened, uh, predictably really, is that it's been harnessed um, by notions of wisdom, which sound much nicer than positive thinking. But if you start to look at it closely, the inner dimensions that guide your work, and it starts to become a form of raising productivity levels in the workplace. So one of the things I didn't say in my introduction about the sort of the fears of what's happening to people's emotional well-being generally is that workers are beginning to be targeted uh, for their well-being because the idea is that we're not engaged enough, we're too, you know, we're a little bit distracted, we're workaholics, etc. So workers, it's not just children and young people, are being drawn into this sort of well-being sort of crisis, if you like, sense of crisis. And when you, again, when you look at the literature that promotes mindfulness, um, it's claimed to counter things like, I didn't know this was a phrase until I read an article, chaos surfing. The idea that us workaholics, I do count myself as one, are just chaos surfers. We just sort of move erratically and fairly 
unproductively between one mad activity and another, and mindfulness is supposed to make us all slow down. It's also supposed to counter what they call distracted parenting. So some parenting classes are advocating that parents and their children do a mindfulness session after supper because the children are too distracted by the internet and so are the parents, so we need to stop being distracted parents. Uh, rising diagnoses of attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder and autism, all are claimed to be countered by mindfulness. And, oh, lo and behold, it, it has the backing of neuroscience, so that lends it a real power. There are, of course, criticisms, as you can hear some of the ones that I'm alluding to. Uh, Barbara Einrich, who wrote a fantastic book called Smile or Die uh, two years ago, where she was recovering from breast cancer, and she lambasted the positive psychology industry and all the cancer self-help groups. It's a brilliant book. I recommend it. But she's written a really scathing piece in a, an online newspaper called The Baffler, which I hadn't come across until someone tweeted it to me. Uh, where she talks about the mass mania for mindfulness. Um, she points out, as many others have, that there are very inflated claims for its effects. It has no better effect, according to critics, than, say, yoga or going for a run or even having a glass of wine and being a distracted parent or whatever. Um, it's the, the more worrying thing, when you start to look at how public policy is beginning to appropriate mindfulness, is that it's being imposed on workers as a sort of um, a vehicle, one, to support their supposed declining emotional well-being, but on the other hand, to raise their productivity. And it's quite difficult if it's um, imposed in workplaces not to do it. It's highly introspective. There's a brilliant example in Barbara Einrich's article where Google are doing mindfulness for the entire company and a group of political protesters uh, raid the meeting because they're protesting against the gentrification of the Bay Area in San Francisco. And the, and the facilitator for mindfulness says, let's use this as a moment to think about what happens when our mindful practice is disrupted in this aggressive way. So it's, there's a very interesting political side to it, which some people argue it's a way of just stopping people thinking too hard about real problems. In other words, it's just a distraction, which you could argue about some of the other interventions as well. So Terry Highland, who is himself a Buddhist, talks about muck mindfulness, and he worries about the ethical principles being stripped away so that it becomes just another type of technology, if you like. So the latest fad, I would say. So one of the things that in trying to think about, um, and it's not easy, of course, especially not in a 40-minute presentation, to think, where is all of this preoccupation and fear and sense of crisis coming from? And of course, I mean, John alluded to the sort of loss of authority, which I think is a very powerful strand in all of this. There are many other uh, factors, social and political, that we could think of. But one of the things that we wanted to do in our book was to relate what we were seeing in schools to a much broader sort of cultural uh, zeitgeist, I suppose, that it has been rising in America since the 1960s, but has really taken off, as Frank Ferreira showed in his book Therapy Culture um, in the 1990s. So we're a bit behind America in this. But it is the idea that we are living in a therapeutic culture. And in James Nolan's book, um, Therapeutic Government, he, he shows really interestingly all the way through the 1960s and 70s how the American state in its legal education and welfare systems began to take on overtly therapeutic ideas and practices and embed them into various areas of policy. Frank Ferreira took that idea and applied it to an American, uh, sorry, to an English, co British context, and we applied it to British schools. So there's a sort of strand of sociological analysis there. Katie Wright, um, in a really interesting book in 2011, took again the idea of therapy culture from those other works and has applied it to an Australian context. And Ken McLaughlin has applied uh, the idea of a therapeutic culture to survivor politics and identity 
politics. So it's not sort of, it's very obvious in a way to say, and these again are just very quick examples, but you could argue we are surrounded by a therapeutic ethos. It comes at us from all directions, uh, from women's magazines. Now men's magazines have even gone for some of the um, sort of ideas of therapy culture. Textbooks, um, textbooks to diagnose your own mental health. That's Pamela Connolly Stevenson's book from 2006. So the idea that we can diagnose our own mental health and identify when we're starting to succumb to mental uh, ill health is a very powerful idea. This is an absolutely brilliant book. I read it for The Dangerous Rise of Therapeutic Education, and we call that research. I don't know. It's called Tigger on the Couch. It takes children's family, uh, sorry, family, fairy stories, and it psychoanalyzes them. And it come, it, it's, a, it's supposed to be a book for children and parents, a very inclusive idea that we educate children and parents about neuroses, um, maladies, etc., uh, and then try to understand them much more empathetically uh, than we might have done before. It's a really clever book, and it's really well written. Psychologist magazine, of course. I did a year reading Psychologist magazine. I have every disorder and syndrome <laughs> under the sun. I did all the quizzes. But the point about it is it's, they are, in a way, amusing. But if you look at some of the ones I've just made up there, uh, do our induction vulnerability quiz. I put that in for my university colleagues. Is your child going to university? Six easy ways to say same. What's really interesting about all those sorts of quizzes and those articles is how they are paralleled by many of the activities that we're seeing in schools, colleges and universities. So they're already very culturally familiar to people. So the idea that I would give my students a questionnaire to assess their resilience, uh, which some schools are now doing routinely, is already embedded in popular culture. So the idea of, of doing these things gains some legitimacy from those sorts of uh, sources. And what, what that's led to, if you look at therapeutic culture and we look at how some of these ideas translate into educational settings, as I've already said, not just schools but colleges and universities as well, we have a number of cultural orthodoxies that are really difficult to challenge or to counter, um, again, especially amongst people who deem themselves to be progressive. So we have the idea that our emotional experiences are baggage that need some sort of airing and support to deal with. We have the idea that our barriers to learning and achievement are primarily psycho-emotional. They're not social, they're not class-based, they're not resource-based, they're primarily in ourselves. The idea that we're more and more of us are emotionally vulnerable to a greater or lesser extent that we need to understand and express ourselves with appropriate support in order to manage uh, and deal with our feelings and our emotions. I've already said that there's the idea that certain activities develop everybody's emotional well-being. And that this is, I think, a very powerful discourse at the moment. The idea that life achievement, educational success, mental health and emotional wellness, if I could put it like that, are inextricably intertwined. You can't have life success without those other things being there. So I think there are some very powerful orthodoxies that come out of popular culture. And what that leads to, if we start to look, as we did in the book, and this is an example from the book, but since we wrote the book, and, um, many, many more examples just keep appearing every single day. This was taken from Edge Hills University Counselling Services website in 2007. And what it does is it suggests, firstly, it, it might seem reasonable, the idea that if you work in health and social care or you're training to um, be a trainee teacher, that being in those placements and in those jobs when you're a student 
is highly stressful. So the idea is that you then uh, can go for counselling. But the, the last bit is very telling, and I, th I don't know about you, but I thought this was the point of university. Students in the disciplines of psychology, sociology, or the expressive arts, could add philosophy, of course. I don't know if they do any philosophy at Edgehill. May find themselves re-examining areas of their lives which have previously seemed unproblematic to them. So the fundamental idea there is that knowledge itself and ideas are sources of such distress that you should maybe think about counselling or some form of emotional support. I did a keynote to the um, 150 heads of the university counselling services uh, last November on some of these themes. And the head of uh, one of the big university counselling services said, if you talked to us five years ago, we would have eaten you alive. And she said, now we agree with every single thing you're saying. And she said, in fact, what we think is happening is that we are victims of our own success, that we have created such a need uh, that we now can't deal with the, the demand for that. So it was a very interesting discussion that I had with them uh, last November. I love this one. It's called Unwieldy Briefs. I always think of big pants. I know I shouldn't. <laughs> sorry, sorry, men and boys in here. It's a girl thing. Um, but this is from the University of Wolverhampton. This is explaining to lecturers, and I like this, research shows. That's always the telling phrase. Research shows that attainment levels can be associated with the quality of the assignment brief. Students report that clear and unwieldy briefs produce learner anxiety. Students spend days trying to decode the brief rather than getting down to the assignment. So basically it's saying just don't make it too complicated. Now the serious point here is that these are just random examples but what's happening in universities is that in very subtle and not so subtle ways our practices are being fundamentally reshaped in response to an image of the vulnerable student that may or may not be true uh, and in a way that you certainly can't challenge. So when we go back to the varieties of men and women, we start to see a new variety appearing in education. So to the final part then, is it a progressive development to... Um, to think about the things that I've outlined, and I've only skated over the surface, really. Proponents claim, and I've argued with many of them over the years and continue to do so, um, that these techniques are variously, depending on their position, essential, in other words, we can't do without them, or just useful or helpful. So many people say to me, well, what's your problem, Catherine? If circle time helps three children at age seven to deal with their anxiety. How can that possibly do any harm? And there is a real interesting question we might have time to think about is, is there really a problem if schools and universities, etc., are putting in place all these types of interventions? Um, so that's, the that's one uh, claim that it's progressive. The other one is much more difficult to challenge um, because what's happening is that critics of I think, and quite rightly, critics of high-stakes testing and the horrible treadmill that we're now seeing in schools of the SATs and endless, endless testing uh, is being conflated with education itself. So people who are really worried about the effects of those sorts of um, features of schooling are saying that what this does, what putting back the emotion, if you like, into schooling does, is to counter some of these uh, nasty effects of things that we're seeing. Um, and as I said about the head of the Cheltenham Ladies College, to the, ar the argument is that not to respond to declining mental health is totally irresponsible. So the minute you raise any questions, uh, you're, you are deemed to be irresponsible. Predictably, I've got three slides that say it's dangerous rather than progressive. Um, so I'm going to just say some of the things here about the evidence base, because the evidence base is quite important. Um, although I tend to not try to get into a debate about the, the actual evidence and what it does and doesn't show, because then you end up in a sort of technical debate between the advocates of mindfulness over the advocates of positive thinking or whatever. But if you look at the field as a whole and you look at all these interventions and the amount of money that has been spent on them 
over the past uh, 20 years or so, there is no convincing evidence base. There's, no, there's been no serious evaluation um, or any longitudinal studies of, of any of these, um, these programs. And there is, if you look at some of the reports that have been done, they're often done by people who advocate the intervention in the first place. So there's a tendency to confirmation bias that you, you want to look for good effects so you find them. One of the other difficulties I've already alluded to is the changing meanings and measures of mental health over time. And a historian colleague of mine at Birmingham wrote a wonderful chapter uh, in the book that I put out in 2013 where he looks at the way that those sorts of meanings and those measures have changed since the 1950s. And he argues that it is impossible to compare measures of mental health over time, both sort of just technically, but also the social constructions that we give to all sorts of things have changed. So that's quite important. I've already talked about the way that we can strip away some of the ethical underpinnings of interventions. But the other thing that I think is also important is that many proponents of interventions are really quite evangelical. And so they argue, will it really help me with my stress or my anxiety? So everybody should have it. So it often gets given to people with no express need. The other more difficult thing to, to try and discern, though, I think, is starting to change the purposes of education itself at all levels. So a bottomless pit of support, my university says, just very starkly, we will support you to achieve. That's it. So you can end up um, in, the, in the vulnerability zeitgeist with that sort of problem. You can also start to see education not about knowledge or the canon, certainly not the canon. The canon is seen as very responsible for a lot of the problems. Um, is It's a lifelong personal development project, um, and I think that's really problematic. I haven't got time to talk about the prevent strategy, which is a shame. And finally, just to think about, again, as I've already alluded to, how does this begin to change the human subject or the variety of man and woman in universities? One of the things that the philosopher John Stuart Mill said in a, a wonderful quote, which I won't quote here, but he, he did raise the basic point that if you ask yourself if you're happy, you could substitute resilient, mentally well, etc. You cease to be so. And what he argued was that the, for the vast majority of, of men and women, those sorts of questions did not bear scrutiny. The minute that you start to examine those sorts of aspects of yourself, you lose them. They float away from you and you become dissatisfied. And he argued that instead of it being um, happiness being a sort of an outcome, a purpose that you, start, you have from the start, it's an outcome, uh, sorry, a byproduct of a meaningful life. In other words, by not focusing on it and focusing on meaningful things, um, you, you, you achieve it. So I want to just end with this idea that the varieties of men and women that we're dealing with in schools, colleges and universities are highly problematic if we start to view them through the lens of some of these assumptions. It does beg the question, which we might get to in the discussion, which I think we've got about 10 minutes for, is, okay, it's a bit like John ended with, so what do you do? A lot of people say to me, well, if you object to some of these developments, what are you going to put in their place? And how are you going to deal with the fact that growing numbers of young people and children and workers seem to be experiencing stress, anxiety, and all sorts of other, sort of what William Davis calls a psychological malaise. So we can't just say it's socially constructed. We can't just say, well, meanings have been changed out of all recognition. There is something going on to which schools and other educational institutions have to respond to. So the question is, if not these sorts of things, and some of you may think they're okay or, or whatever, then what? So I think that's a question that... Um, one does have to really think about, but I'll end there. Thank you very much.